right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Mark Pittman, who is in Greenville, South Carolina. How are you doing, Mark? I am super glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And, uh, and Mark is the founder of the Concord Leadership Group and helps leaders lead their teams with more effectiveness and less stress. And what we're gonna talk about today, which is very exciting, is Mark's new book, The Surprising Gift of Doubt, Use Uncertainty to Become the Exceptional Leader You Are Meant to Be. Uh, so Mark, let's, let's dive straight into it. So a lot of people would perceive that, you know, top, you know, good leaders and successful people have an absence of doubt, but that's not really true. Not if they're human. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not if they're there are some narcissistic personalities that appear to not have <laughs> not have yeah, exactly. issues with that. But most human beings have there's we all know that there are things we don't know. And we are far more aware of what we don't know often than what we do know. And so that creates the doubt um, that can really plague us because we don't see other it's not something you share with somebody. You don't walk up to next to someone and say, I don't know what I'm doing either. Uh, because <laughs> You're trying to develop a team. You're trying to help sell, sell something to a client. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons why you want to look confident. And so it can be something that festers because you don't realize other people share the same, same or similar uh, feelings or lack of knowledge or uh, lack of certainty. Yeah. And, the, and one of the things that you focus in on is the imposter syndrome, right? Which is something like I'm, I'm, I, I've uh, talked to a lot of people about, and I think it's so much more prevalent than, than people think. Yeah, it's part of it is the, and I think it's because mostly because of people's good intentions. They, because they know what they don't know, it's that fake it till you make it. Uh, there's a good part of fake it till you make it where um, you're just stretching outside of your comfort zone. It's mm -hmm. just called growth. Uh, but then there's a part where you're, you're feeling like you're being 100% inauthentic and charlatany. Um, I don't know if charlatan E is a word, but um, the, I, talked to some, I just <laughs> I just talked to somebody yesterday who is um, had spent was a manager for years and then tried to go into sales and it wasn't a sales manager before, but didn't like the the feeling of having to have every conversation lead to a close. Um, and I don't know if he was I think he was probably still in the first phase of going outside your comfort zone to have those strategic conversations because if you have something that you can offer somebody else, then why wouldn't you serve them by saying, at least, you know, help them take action on something that could help them. But um, the imposter syndrome of, I clearly don't know what I'm doing and everybody else seems to be bamboozled by me. Oh no, what do I do now? <laughs> like the Wizard of Oz, don't look at the man behind the green curtain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's amazing how much that, uh, you know, afflicts people, even when they have like tremendous experience and track records behind them, they still, they're still almost afraid, like waiting, as you said, to be found out. Uh, totally to be found out that they're just posing one, I talked to one very accomplished leader who was brought into an organization, grew it from, uh, I think it was 1 million to, to I think it was 20 million. And um, he had had a board that was sparring with him. But as he had more success, they just kind of started leaning back because he was, became the golden child. They knew he had it. They knew he can, you know, when he, whatever he decided was going to work. And um, he didn't realize until after uh, one of these sessions that what had happened to him was he liked the sparring <laughs> and he did <laughs> not like the, the, um, the hands off uh, because he knew that he wasn't always right. And he wanted some pushback. He felt like he became better. Uh, and he felt he was, he was really scared to not have that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so like, getting into your book, uh, you talk about the inner nudge. What is the inner nudge? Well, it's that part when you're dealing with that imposter syndrome, when you're, you're thinking, yeah, but about things like you're learning mm -hmm. something and um, whether it's a time management tool or a working with people tool, and there's always the, I get this much, whether it's 10% or 80%, but, the, but this part doesn't work. And an example could be, um, well, with the uh, with nonprofit uh, fundraisers that I've worked with, if it's always pick up the phone, make the call, get out in front and meet people, talk to people alive, and you're an introvert, the but might be, 
I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm not energized by the uncertainty of the different conversations. So it could be that the nudge could be inviting you to, to start with a letter. Even if you never send the letters, write out the letter, figure out what it is you're going to say, maybe mail the letter uh, because it turns out introverts have an amazing ability to think before they speak. And that will help you come up with some of the things that you could talk about. And it may set the stage for the other person, which it took me years of training to not, I, I'm not advising that for training to realize that there are people that would respond differently. So that inner nudge is uh, the one that I'm talking about is not throwing out all the good stuff that you've learned, sure. but it's, it's incorporating it and making it your own instead of just trying to copy somebody else, actually becoming the full, the, the more full and more authentic yourself, more authentic. Uh, the, absolutely. I love that thing about the, uh, the introverts, like thinking before they speak, I think perhaps the whole world needs to become an introvert for a little bit. Like well, the world might be a better happy, place. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, I just I just responded yeah. with words. Whoops. <laughs> Showed my cards. <laughs> you know, another another interesting. So if you if you do decide and that you know that you want to do something and you want to move forward and, and you want to embrace opportunities, you talk about accepting your gifts. And I mean, that would seem, again, sort of a little bit counterintuitive because you would think like, oh, you know, you celebrate your gifts, but that's not always true either, is it? <laughs> no, because sometimes our gifts don't always uh, look, the, look like gifts to us because we're so used to them. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's when other people are able to, to, to acknowledge them. And, and part of it for us is just is learning uh, how we're wired, uh, it's behavior, it's actual cognitive ability and the quickness you can get things done. Your, uh, it's, and it's also motivations. How, you, how are you motivated? Not just why do you do things the way you do, but what's the story you're living out of? And as you start figuring out some of those things, you can accept your limitations, which is one of the hardest things about, I think, human existence is that we can't do it all. But one of the gifts of leadership is that you're not while you you get into leadership thinking you're supposed to do it all, but you learn that you're not. That's why you have mm -hmm. a team, whether it's a team of two or three or thousands, that's why you can do so much more if you work for them. And when, as you learn your limitations, you learn that some people love to do the stuff you don't. And it yeah. kind of feels like you're cheating because you're not doing the stuff that you don't like to do, but they're having a blast doing the books or doing the other things, doing whatever. Um, yeah, no, yeah, it's, so it's, it is. That's a wonderful thing when you discover that. But here's the thing is, right? Uh, Self-awareness is is obviously key to this, because um, let's face it, as you said, uh, sometimes the gifts that we wish we had are the ones that we don't have. And we either downplay or ignore or, or as I said, degrade the gifts that we actually do have. We spend too much time focusing on the things we don't have. Well, I think a lot of that is because of the, our in, in North America anyway. The schooling that we go through, it's usually looking at your weaknesses, where are you falling short and how do you shore those up? How do you strengthen those? A lot of our performance, despite all the good work from Gallup, a lot of our performance evaluations and work is, oh, you're really good at these things, but here are the three or four things you really need to pull up and do better at. Um, so we tend to downplay our strengths, not realizing we always, we tend, we tend to be trained to look at our weakness. Uh, and when we get to start being free to, to be good at what we do, uh, that can be really transformative and it feels awkward at first because you start having a little bit more joy and, and things are a little hmm. bit easier because you're doing things that are, that come naturally to you that don't naturally not normally to other people. Um, so it takes some baby stepping and trying to beta test some things and realizing, wow, I guess I do have something to offer. This is a part of my unique voice or, or my unique way of, of doing this. It won't look like the past leader. That's a problem with a lot of leadership uh, replacements, especially senior leader. People go for the opposite. If they had somebody that was really charismatic and outgoing, but didn't really do details well, they go for a details person and they, they sell that details person on, we need you. This is what we need. This is our vision and all. And then they start getting really bent out of shape after the details person's there because they're like, well, where's, where's the personality? Why aren't you out seeing yeah. us and all? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it also then, helps to have teams that are more aware of these conversations for sure yeah yeah and then they end up hiring like a coo or something like with the with the charismatic personality to try and uh, offset. right the, to, to, yeah exactly it's like uh oh <laughs> we have to hire two people to fill this one yeah yeah and yeah. um, the other interesting um thing there that i was just about uh, that i was going to comment on is um you know as i said the idea about recognizing your own gifts and that um uh, 
and, and being comfortable being comfortable with that. You also talk about um, realizing the benefits of your ability. And I think that's the other thing is, again, we sometimes look at everything else. Uh, we don't look at our own, our own gifts and our own abilities and how they can best be uh, deployed. Yeah, one of the uh, John Eldridge is an author that I've listened, I've, I've learned from, and one of the things he helps people do, and I've used with my coaching clients too, is have your think about the stories you keep going back to, and think about the characters and the stories that you most identify with or most admire. Um, typically, that makes us feel really it feels woo woo, it feels you know, <laughs> weird, but because doesn't everybody love this? For me, it was Lord of the Rings, Gandalf. Of course, everybody's going to say Gandalf. In the group I was in at the time, nobody else said Gandalf. And so that caused me to go to another level of what is it about Gandalf that I resonate with? And it was a way of doing what you just said earlier, of taking my gifts, the stuff that I, that I saw as strengths and seeing them in somebody else helped me to then bring them back. Not that I'm a wizard uh, that can ride a horse. I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm I'm pretty impressed. (laughs) Pandemic hair is getting longer, but um, the beard is still short. But what it was for me was Gandalf was a studious nerd. He spent years in the books trying to figure out what this ring was. And that is what I like to do whenever I share in front of an audience or in front of a coaching client. I don't want to share anything that hasn't been researched and I can't get my hands on the primary material because people's time is to and trust is too important. But he's also a fighter. He wasn't just going to stay in a library. He was going to go out there and, um, and change the world and uh, kick butt when he did it. And that was, those are two components of me. Uh, I've had other clients that have had similar experiences with the characters they liked. And it was a way of seeing themselves in a different light that totally fit. And it was almost like a gear fell into place when you do that. Um, yeah, so, those, so go, seeing those characters, so, those fictional characters can be helpful. Yeah. So how do you discover those? I mean, some people like say, well, I don't, I don't know if I have any stories or characters, but, um, but I guess that's the first step. Probably does. <laughs> <laughs> the first step is this is a stupid assignment. So it's finding someone that will ask you that you, that you're scared to not come up with an answer for. <laughs> that's what happened to me. It's like, oh no, I, I was leading the small group and I thought, oh no, I have to come up with an answer because all the other people are thinking that I know who this is. Um, Part of it is I, one of the things that leaders uh, are, there are three areas that leaders need to focus in. Um, there's the, the clients, the customers, whatever the mission, whatever you're doing, there's the team, and then there's yourself. And I think part of what we do as leaders is we get so used to early in our career, getting graded on getting stuff done, um, tasks completed, that we don't realize as we go up in leadership, that it's not so much the tasks that we get done as the um the vision we cast in the way we facilitate the task getting done. If you start going in and trying to do the first the frontline person's job, you're micromanaging. Uh, and mm-hmm. it's an expense. You're an expensive version of that typically in most organizations. So I think part of the way you learn what characters are and all that is to um, not necessarily, it, just to give yourself some space, knowing that you're not cheating. If you take two hours to read on uh, two hours a week to, to invest in being a better leader. Uh, some sort of professional development, creating that space can start earthing those things, uh, sh- loosening the dirt, loosening the ground that you're in. Mm-hmm. And I guess one other thing I'd say, John, too, is that it's not a linear process. So one of the things that one of the 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 quadrant three model that I talk about of all the different aspects of of leadership development that are the gift of doubt, like the different mm-hmm. tools that I offer. Yeah. Um, I really I cringe because. It looks sequential and orderly, but it's not. It's life. It's organic. It's messy. It's three dimensional. And so, it may not be the if you're. It may not be the characters and fictional stories. And maybe identifying your core values and looking at your teams or your organizations and seeing if there's a dissonance there. Um, you might be learning how to do goal setting and include your personal goals with your job of effective right. goals. So there's a, a lot of different ways that you can come at this. Uh, so if one, I, I had a mentor that said, "Eat the chicken, spit out the bones." If one of the approaches doesn't work try something else uh, because there's a lot of good, good tools out there to, and, and strategies to work on. No, I'm absolutely. And I think one of the, one of the other parts then is, as you said, I mean, there's a tendency um, to want to take over and do a lot of things and maybe do things that other people could do and actually probably do better. Uh, so part of this uh, on your journey is the ability to trust right? To trust other people and then accept that other people are not going to do things the same way as you might do them. That's so hard, right? The, um, the one, some of the best um, sales managers I've seen are people that aren't necessarily good at sales, but they're good at coaching. Mm-hmm. They know 
what the outcomes are. So everybody can be agreed on what the outcomes are. And they're not trying to create mini means. They're not trying to force people to act in the way that they would normally do it. They're not reading their bio, you know, showing their own bi biographical documentary every time somebody makes a mistake, but they're helping them um, introverts or withdrawn people or dependent people or aggressive people or extroverts, whatever the case is, they're trying to help them. We agreed on these outcomes. Both of us agreed this is the outcomes for you to have be employed here. How can we help you make that happen? And um, that that frees you up a bit from being have, trying to recreate yourself or having it done the same way. I think it can be problematic if it's all task lists. Um, although there are reasons for task lists too, but um, yeah, I think some learning some. I think everybody can. I'm a little biased, but I think everybody can learn a uh, benefit from learning from some coaching. Uh, yeah, no, or no, improv I, I, skills, either one. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> I would say I would say coaching. I, I say this all the time on these interviews: is that it's amazing um, that uh, you know we will spend an inordinate amount of money on on coaching or whatever for our our, our hobbies, things that yeah they're fun to do, but they're not going to put bread on the table. Right. But, but a lot of people won't spend a penny on on coaching for the thing that actually. <laughs> Puts bread, on, puts the bread table. on the table, right? That's yeah. a really good point. Wow. Yeah, you know, you can next time you ask somebody, say like, you know, what 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 are your hobbies? How much of you know? Do you ever get coaching or ever like if you're golf? Do you ever get like you know? Do you have a a, a golf coach? And they go, oh yeah, and you say, oh, so I presume you have a business coach too. You go, what? Business coach? Perfect. <laughs> that is really really good. <laughs> yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I just wanted to talk about is the concept of integrity. And it's the last chapter in your book where you talk about honoring your integrity. And it seems like today we live in a, in a world, um, business world, you know, regular world or whatever, where integrity is increasingly a diminishing uh, commodity, I would say. So what is what is the power between? I mean, number one, how do you how do you ensure that you are operating with integrity in the first place? And then how do you honor your own integrity? Well, and that's, there's, and that's, yeah, that, that's a huge question unpacked. The way I define, well, first of all, I think honesty and integrity are the best um, tools that you could ever have as a leader. Mm -hmm. um, that way you don't have to, you know, remember what story you told somebody else. It's the same story. Yeah. Um, but the way I define integrity is when you're hardwiring and your stories and your goals and your personal um, mission and your, your vision and values are working together, they're integrated. And there's a solidity in that. So when you know that you know why you're making the decisions you're making, that's um, that's where I talk about the integrity model. Part of that, I think, is uh, if, if people just leaving this conversation, it'd be values. Knowing what, what you value and that you're in integrity to what you're, you value. For me, one of the values when I was going through coach training 20 years ago was uh, independence. And it was an interesting guiding principle that oh, I may need to flex on this value here because I'm part of a team and the team's goals are important, or I may not want to choose this position or this, this occupation because it's going to re really clamp down on my ability to be independent. Um, and so being in integrity with myself helped me to be actually save that organization money too, I'm sure, because I didn't have to be <laughs> kind of great strafing uh, with, that, with their every decision that they made that I would feel as micromanaging and inflicting on my creativity. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's a very good point there that you raise. So I think that uh, before you start any of this journey, to be honest, or the next phase of your journey is establishing what your core values or core principles are, because I guarantee you um, a lot of people don't know that or have never yeah. even thought about it deeply. And, and at some stage of your career in your life, these things are going to become foundational and they're going to dictate what happens from there on in. And I would just submit to people, it's okay to get it wrong, to try it mm -hmm. out. So if you Google values inventories, there's a ton on the web. There's one on conqueredleadershipgroup.com slash values on my site. But um, they're basically a lot of list of words. And so you were, and, and just circle the ones that seem to resonate with you. Get out a piece of paper and say, what are the things that are important to me? Just jot them down and live with them for a while and see if they still resonate. Um, and and then my friend Brent Mansoir also says that if you looked for his story, your core, your core values are the ones that you can see that you've done in the past. Your aspirational, the values are the ones that you haven't yet have a story or at a point in time where you actually worked on that. And, and there's nothing wrong with aspirational values, but knowing your core ones early in your career at any point in your career can really help you make decisions that are 
best suited for you uh, and the people that are dependent on you. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, fantastic. Uh, this has been a wonderful interview and a lot of great uh, insights in here. The book is called The Surprising Gift of Doubt. Use uncertainty to become the exceptional leader you are meant to be um, from Mark Pittman. All of Mark's information is going to be below this video. The book will all link to the book will also be there. But before we go, Mark, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Uh, I love doing executive coaching and helping people. Um, one person told me that since I did a lot of nonprofit fundraising, um, I help people make sales with no product in return. <laughs> so <laughs> I can help people find solutions to all, all sorts of problems. Uh, my Conquer Leadership Group is my website, uh, and I'm on all the socials on LinkedIn and Twitter, Mark A. Pittman. Um, love to connect with people and help people yeah. excel. Yeah. Yeah, and I would, uh, and uh, and as I said earlier, I would uh, ask yourself uh, where you're investing your time and money. Uh, if you got, uh, wow, you made the top ten of your local golf club's annual tournament because you paid for coaching, um, but you didn't make your quota this year, so now you can't pay for it next year. <laughs> wow. So. <laughs> <laughs> So I would, I'm just saying I would encourage people to seriously look into professional coaching for the thing that actually puts bread on the table. And the thing that you're going to be, that you're doing five days, maybe even seven days a week, as opposed to one or two days a week. It's amazing how much more peace and confidence it gives when you have somebody outside of your hiring and firing system that you can talk to about yeah. some of the things that you're, you're wrestling with and trying to, trying to work through. And it adds that, uh, just before we go, just add, it adds that level of accountability. Because it's all very well to try and do things on your own, which is great. But when you involve a third party, now you're accountable to somebody other than yourself. Yep, That's so true. <laughs> all right. Listen, thanks, Mark. This has been great. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I'll see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.